Pushed back the door. Good morning, everyone. 
It is so good to see you all here gathered this morning for, uh, for worship. My name is Jesse Holmes. I serve as a discipleship pastor here at Crawford Avenue. And I'm going to share a few announcements with you as we prepare our hearts and minds for gathered worship. During last week's members meeting, the elders nominated Andy Sanders to serve for the first time as lay elder and Chris Holmeyer to serve another term as deacon of services. So on July the 9th, immediately following gathered worship, the entire church family, all the members of Crawford Avenue, will gather for a brief members meeting in order to vote on uh, Andy Sanders and Chris Holmeyer. So please make a special note that all members are uh, asked to remain after service on July the 9th in order to vote on Andy Sanders and Chris Holmeyer. If you happen to be interested in becoming a member here at Crawford Avenue Baptist Church, or you're just interested in learning more about our church, we would like to invite you to our next Blueprint membership meeting. It will be held here at Crawford Avenue on Sunday, July the 23rd from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. Dinner and child care are provided, and so if you are interested, we'll ask that you will scan this QR code in order to register. Now, for more information about any of the events that you see that's found on the back of your bulletin, and to register for any of those events, we'll invite you to scan that QR code, and there you'll find more information and be able to register. Now, you may be a guest with us here today, and we are so glad that you're here. We want to extend a special welcome to you, and we would like to ask you to do two things. First, if you scan this QR code, this will give you an opportunity to tell us a little bit more about yourself. Let us know how you heard about Crawford Avenue and give us an opportunity to tell you more about Crawford Avenue and answer any questions that you might have. So we would like to invite you to scan and fill out the form with as much information as you like, and we'll be sure to get connected with you this week. Also, if you need to, there are paper connection cards found in the various black boxes at the various exits, so we we'll invite you to fill it out and place it in the black box. Secondly, again, if you are a first-time guest, we have a special gift for you. So we would like to invite you to our welcome table, which is now found in the foyer. There you'll find a smiling face who can answer any questions you might have, and they'll have a special gift for you. So if you're a first-time guest, be sure to stop by the welcome table. We'll also be worshiping through giving this morning, and there are a few ways that you can give. You can give by text. You can give online. Or you can place your physical offerings in one of the black boxes at the various exits. Well, we have gathered here this morning to worship God. Our good and our gracious God has demonstrated his love toward us by sending his son, Jesus Christ, who is our great hope. And though this world is filled with hurts and pains and tribulation, we who have Jesus Christ as our hope can rest assured that this life is not the end, and that the words that Jesus spoke to his disciples apply to us today when he said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Let us now prepare our hearts and our minds to worship our great hope, Jesus Christ, with a time of silent prayer. Let us pray silently together now. Heavenly Father, you are our joy, our hope, our light, and our peace. 
You sent your son, the Lord Jesus, to rescue us and redeem us from sin and its many struggles. Lord, some of us come with hearts that are heavy and tired from the week that's happened this, just this past week. Um, we long for the resolution of heaven where all things will be made new and we will be made perfect. Some of us come with glad and jubilant hearts for we've tasted and seen that the Lord is good and we know that heaven will be filled with more of Christ's glorious perfection and that by his grace, we will be there with him someday to enjoy him forever. Until that day comes, Lord, help us to see each new day in light of that day. Oh, Lord, encourage us by your spirit as we sing, as we pray, as we study and fellowship in the light of your truth. We look forward to that day when we will be gathered to your throne. But until that day arrives, we commit ourselves to gathering here below as your church, as a foreshadow of what's to come. Be with us, Lord. Guide our hearts and our minds and our tongues as we worship. It's in Christ's name we ask all of this. Amen. Friends, our days on earth are fraught with pain, sorrow, difficulty, disappointment, stress. But all of those who have trusted in Christ have a greater hope when all these smaller hopes fade. We know that the Lord will not forsake us. Let's stand and begin with a reading from Psalm 37. We'll read the underlined portions out loud together. It's from Psalm 37. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Better is the little that the righteous has than the abundance of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. But the wicked will perish. The enemies of the Lord are like the glory of the pastures. They vanish. Like smoke, they vanish away. The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds his hand.
God is unwavering, unchanging, and as James writes in his epistle, with him there is not even a shifting shadow due to change. His holiness and his perfections never wax, they never wane, for he is the fount and foundation of all that exists. We, however, are not so resolute in our holiness, and we must come before the Lord regularly to confess sins of pride, Anger, apathy, impatience, lust, covetousness, idolatry, and there's still more. Thankfully, this same perfect God promises to hear us and forgive us when we confess our sins under the blood and banner of Jesus. Let's go to him now, confessing our sin in silent prayer. O Lord, with our eyes fixed heavenward, help us, Lord, to cast behind us all that is earthly, lowly, and sinful. Lord, we trust in you not only to save us from our sins but to deliver us in, and deliver us into heaven, but to also help us live our lives in light of your truth. O Lord, hear us as we confess our sins to you. We ask that you forgive us. If we are hard-hearted about our sin, we ask that you would break us in all the places that we need to be broken, that we might be put back together in ways that make us more like Christ. Grant us counsel by your Holy Spirit. O oh Lord, comfort us with your promises. May sin be more and more dissatisfying as we find greater satisfaction in you. We call upon you in the name of Christ, the one who delivers us from death and cleanses us of all unrighteousness. Amen. Gracious Lord, in thine thy my request thou save to me. Hear my never-ceasing cry, hear me Christ or else I die.
Good morning. My name is Don Pizzotta, and I serve as one of the elders here at Crawford Avenue Baptist Church. And this is the portion of our service where we will enter into corporate prayer together. There are a few things that we'll pray about. Um, as was mentioned in the announcements this morning, we want to be in prayer for Andy Sanders and for Chris Homeyer as we consider uh, their service to this church. And we also pray for uh, our nation as we anticipate celebrating our uh, Independence Day on the 4th, uh, we'll pray for the nation uh, that we call home. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, creator of all things, we thank you for your grace and mercy. And we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together this morning and worship you. We thank you, Lord, for your sovereignty over all things. And so we are grateful this morning for Andy Sanders and for his wife, Eileen, and for Chris Homeyer and his wife, Julia. We're thankful for these men and their families as we consider their continued service or new service to this church and to you. As we consider Andy to serve as an elder, Father, we ask that you would protect him that you would lead and guide him and stir in our hearts to pray for him and his family. We thank you for the many leaders that you have raised up from amongst Crawford Avenue. And so we're grateful for Chris and his family and the year of his service as a deacon. We pray as we consider him for another term that we would pray for him. We thank you for his faithfulness and his willingness to continue to serve. We pray, Lord, that you would bless him and Julia as we consider him. Father, we are especially grateful for our nation's independence this weekend. The freedom of this nation granted by your hand. A freedom that allows us to even gather here together to worship you freely. We thank you for the men and women of this nation who have served and continue to serve to keep that freedom secure. For the many men and women, even in this room, who serve this nation, we pray, Lord, that you would protect them, protect them from the evil one, protect them from the worldliness that runs rampant through our nation. We thank you for the countless men and women who have given the ultimate sacrifice of their life for freedom's sake. And we ask that those who are in harm's way, even this morning, that you would protect them. Draw them closer to yourself so that they might know you. We pray, Lord, now that you would protect them and draw them to yourself in, in a salvific way. We also pray for the leaders of this nation that they would wake up, that they would turn from their sinfulness and turn to you. As we celebrate freedom, Father, we pray that we would be reminded anew of our ultimate freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. The freedom from the bondage of sin and death that you have made known to us through your word. The freedom that we have as believers because of the finished work of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the freedom that Jesus has secured through his death on the cross paying the price for our sins. We thank you for the freedom from death that we enjoy through the resurrection of your son. Father, we pray that we would remember our freedom in Christ. Even as we celebrate our freedom as a nation, we pray, Lord, that we would remember. We also pray that for the nations around the world who know nothing of freedom, we especially pray for your church in those nations as they face persecution. We ask for your mercy. And Father, we ask for your grace to rain down on this globe so that your name would be made great to the ends of the earth. 
so that your kingdom would advance to every corner of this earth, and so that your people from every tribe, tongue, and nation might glorify you and enjoy you forever. We praise you for the glorious message of the gospel and the promises that we find in your word, the promises of freedom and liberty, and most of all, the promise of salvation, the free gift of grace found throughout your scripture. Father, let us all become not only learners of your word, but examples of the gospel. Let us not take for granted the freedom we have in this nation, nor take for granted the freedom that we have as believers. Give us strength to be examples of the gospel to those around us, in our families and in our homes, in our schools and in our places of work. Let us be bold in our proclamation of your good news to those around us. We pray, Lord, that you will send your spirit to teach, to guide, and to comfort us as we continue to worship you this morning. We pray that our eyes and ears would be open to see and hear your word proclaimed. And we pray, Lord, that our voices would be awakened to praise you for your glory and for our good. Father, continue to feed us with your word, strengthen us through your word, and give us all a desire to seek after you in your word. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, for your glory. Amen. Amen. Well, no matter what may come our way, we have a steadfast hope in the Lord that cannot be shaken even in the face of death. Let's stand to sing of Christ who comforts our hearts and grants us assurance. When
Amen. Church, please be seated. Amen. Well, I invite you to take your copy of Scripture and turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And uh, as we've been working through Romans 8, we uh, come this morning to verses 23 to 25. And I'm going to begin reading for us in verse 18 and read through to verse 25. And then we'll focus on verses 23 to 25. So if, uh, if you don't have a Bible with you this morning, I encourage you to look around you. And you should find a Bible there that we provide for you. And you'll find our passage on page 944. 944. So Romans chapter 8, and I'll begin reading for us in verse 18. Apostle Paul writes, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Verse 23. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege of worship. We thank you, Lord, for how we've already been challenged and encouraged through your word and through singing, through prayer. We pray now, Lord, that as we turn to your word, that you would speak to us with clarity, with power, by the power of your spirit. And Lord, we pray that you would fill us with the hope of which Paul speaks of in these verses. And it's through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Well, groaning is part of the human experience. We might be laid off from our job and the bills begin to mount and we groan. We might be seeking to honor the Lord in our marriage and yet we're not making any progress. And so we groan. Our child may be diagnosed with a chronic health condition, and we groan. Friends move away, and family members die, and we increasingly feel isolated and alone, and as a result, we groan. Groaning is part of the universal human experience. All of us, at one time or another, will groan in this life. The word actually that is used here in chapter 8, verse 23 of Romans chapter 8, groan, is actually uh, defined by a Greek dictionary this way, quote, to express oneself involuntarily in the face of an undesirable circumstance, to sigh, to groan. And understand that biblical groaning is not murmuring, it's not complaining, Biblical groaning is not resentment or bitterness against God. Biblical groaning is not unbelief. Rather, biblical groaning is when our emotional life connects with our own fallenness and with the brokenness of this world. And when our emotional life connects with our own fallenness and with the brokenness of this world... We groan. In Mark chapter 7, we're told that Jesus went to the region of the Decapolis, and as he went there, the crowd brought to him 
a man who was deaf. He could not hear, and also he could not speak properly. And as the man was brought to Jesus, we read in Mark chapter 7, verse 34, that Jesus, when he saw the man, looked up into heaven and he sighed. Actually, the word that is used there in Mark chapter 7 is the same word that Paul uses here in Romans chapter 8. He groaned. And Jesus said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, and his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. You see, like Jesus, when our emotional life connects with the reality of the fallenness of humanity and the brokenness of this world, like Jesus, we groan, we sigh. But as Paul teaches us here in Romans chapter 8, because we are Christians, because we are children of God, we groan and we sigh in hope. You see it there in verse 23 and 24. He says, we ourselves groan inwardly. Now notice the hope here. As we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. So last week we saw that creation groans. And what we see this week in our text is that the children of God groan. But the Christian's groaning is not a hopeless groan. Rather, the Christian's groaning is full of hope. And so as we turn to our text this morning, I want us to consider four characteristics of the hope of the children of God. Four characteristics of the hope of the children of God. So we'll see in our text the who, the what, the nature, and the comparison of the hope of the children of God. The who, the what, the nature, and the comparison of of the hope of the children of God. Notice, first of all, the who of the hope of the children of God. Look there in verse 23, and we read these words. And not only creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly. Now, of course the who here is, in fact, the children of God, but there's more. Paul has more to say here about the children of God. Who are these children of God? Well, in chapter 8, verse 23, Paul identifies the children of God as those who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Now, what does that mean? That we have the first fruits of the Spirit. Now, you might initially think that Paul is referring here to the fruits of the Spirit. That would be a good instinct. That would indicate that you know something about the Bible and so forth, because Paul does in another place speak about the fruits of the Holy Spirit. So in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, Paul says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so the first fruit of the Spirit is love. And so you might think, well, Paul here is referring to love. But that's actually not what Paul is referring to here. Paul is not making a reference to the first of the fruits of the Spirit. Rather, Paul is appealing here to an agricultural concept that has roots in the Old Testament Scriptures. So here, Paul is not referring to the first of the fruits of the Spirit, but rather he's referring to the first of the fruits of the harvest. In my own personal Bible reading, I recently was reading through... uh, Leviticus and Numbers and then Deuteronomy. And in Numbers chapter 28, verse 26 through 30, Moses gives instructions for the celebration of the Feast of Weeks, or it's also known as the Feast of Harvest. And in Numbers 28, verse 26, Moses writes, On the day of the first fruits, when you offer a grain offering of new grain to the Lord at your Feast of Weeks, you shall have a holy convocation. So you see here, the first fruits are representative of the first of the yearly harvest. So if you have a garden in your yard, maybe you plant tomatoes, the first tomato that comes uh, forth and is ready to pick, that would be symbolic of the first fruits of the full harvest that is to come. 
Or maybe you don't like tomatoes. Maybe you like watermelons. You have watermelons in your yard. And first watermelon, I see some kids raising their hands, first watermelon that comes that you can pick and you can eat, that's the first fruits of the harvest that is to come. And the Israelites were to bring the first fruits, the first of their harvest, to the Lord as an offering of thanksgiving, as an offering of praise. And these first fruits were a sign, a pledge of the full harvest to come. Now here's, here's the really interesting thing. The Feast of Weeks, or the Feast of Harvest, took place seven weeks, or we could say 50 days after Passover. Okay? Now, when was Jesus crucified? Jesus was crucified during Passover. And then we know from the scriptures that three days later he was raised from the dead. And then the scriptures tell us that for 40 days, on various occasions, Jesus appeared to his disciples. So we've got, he dies. Three days resurrected, about 40 days. He's appearing to the disciples, various locations, various times. And then 50 days from Passover, there's the celebration of the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Harvest, which is also referred to in Greek as Pentecost. And what happened at Pentecost? God gifted His people, granted His people the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we read in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all gathered together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now why was the Spirit given at Pentecost? Why was the Spirit given at the Feast of Harvest? It was symbolic of the fact that the Spirit was the first fruits of the redemption of God. The first fruits of God's redemption. And the full redemption, the full harvest of God's redemption was to come. So you see the connection that Paul is making here. The person and work of the Spirit is the first fruits of our redemption. This is in fact what Paul has been talking about in the earlier part of Romans chapter 8. If you look at Romans 8, 1 through 17, which we talked about for several weeks, we saw there that it's the Spirit who opens our eyes to our own sinfulness and need for a Savior. He grants us spiritual life as He enables us to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and receive the forgiveness of our sins. It's the Spirit then who indwells us and now enables us to walk and live according to the righteous requirement of God's Word and His law. Not perfectly, but truly. Not fully, but progressively, we become more and more like Jesus by the power and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And this, Paul says, is just the first fruits, right? The first fruits of our redemption and salvation. And having experienced the first fruits, having been delivered from shame and guilt and the bondage and the despair of sin and having experienced the life of the Spirit and the forgiveness of God's grace and mercy and the power to walk in obedience to God, having experienced that, now we groan, we long for the full harvest. The full harvest of our salvation and redemption. This is in fact part of what it means to be a child of God. It means to be, be indwelt by the Holy Spirit and to possess a holy groaning and longing and aching for God's full redemption. So that's the who of the hope of the children of God. It is we, those who have this hope are those who have experienced the first fruits of the Spirit. Now... The what of the hope of the children of God. So this is our second point. The what of the hope of the children of God. Look there in verse 23 and we read these words. And not only creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption 
of our bodies. So what do the children of God hope for? Well, in the immediate context, you see it there, we wait eagerly, here it is, for adoption as sons. Now remember, as we've been going through Romans chapter 8, we've seen that we are already sons of God. We are already children of God. You see it there in verses 15 through 17 of Romans 8. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. So in one sense, we are already the children of God. We have been adopted as sons of God. But there's more, Paul says here, in relationship to our adoption. The Father has adopted us. He's made us His own. He's enveloped us into His family. And at the same time, the full benefits and privileges and realization of our adoption is not behind us, but rather in front of us. It is yet to come. And what do we have to look forward to? Well, notice what he says there in verse 23. We wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, and here it is. What what is it that we experience when we receive the full benefits of our adoption? He says it, next thing. We wait eagerly for the adoption of sons. Here it is, the redemption of our bodies. Now last week we saw that creation has been adversely affected by the fall, right? The way that Paul talks about it is he says that creation has been subjected to futility. That creation suffers under the bondage of corruption. And we know that part of this curse, this that has come upon creation is that our own bodies have been adversely affected by the curse and the fall, by the curse of sin and by the fall. So, of course, we know that our bodies sometimes malfunction. They are susceptible to various sicknesses and diseases. Our bodies succumb to the corruption and decay of time. And eventually, the battery life in our body will run out and we will die. But Paul says not only are our physical bodies susceptible to this corruption and decay as a result of the fall, but Paul has reminded us throughout Romans chapters 6 through 8 that although the body is God's good creation, he originally created the body as good, as a result of the fall, the body has become the vehicle through which sin expresses itself. So back in Romans 6 verse 6 we read, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. Or in Romans 6 verse 12 we read, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Or in Romans 7 verse 24, Paul says, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So our bodies are susceptible to the decay and corruption that is a result of the fall. And our bodies have become this vehicle through which sin expresses itself. And Paul cries out at the end of Romans chapter 7, Who will save me from this body of sin? Who will save me from this body of death? And then he exclaims, The Lord Jesus, He will save me. But now in Romans chapter 8 verse 23... He tells us particularly what that salvation, what that deliverance will look like. And what he says here in Romans chapter 8 verse 23 is that when I receive the full benefits and the full privileges of my adoption as a child of God, God will redeem my body so that my body will never be used again as a vehicle for sin to express itself. But it will always and only be used as a vehicle by which the Holy Spirit will express Himself so that I might enjoy and glorify God forever. And my body will be set free from futility and corruption and decay and death. And my body will be made whole and it will be made complete and it will be redeemed and it will never run down and it will never run out. So in this way, 
if the Spirit is the first fruits of our salvation, we could say that the redemption and restoration of our bodies is the harvest. It is what's to come. This restoration and redemption of our bodies is not only promised in Scripture, but one of the things we see so beautifully is that it is demonstrated in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus. Earlier I mentioned from Mark chapter 7 the healing of the deaf man. But we know that Jesus healed many other people as well. He healed folks of many diseases and illnesses. He cast out demons. He gave sight to the blind. He enabled the lame to walk. He cleansed leopards. He even raised people from the dead. And what was going on when Jesus was performing all of these various miracles? Was Jesus just showing off his superpowers? Of course not, right? Jesus is not just found throwing donkeys over houses and shooting fireballs out of his fingers. That's not what Jesus is doing. Each one of these healings is a sign. It's a sign that the kingdom has come. And it's a sign of what life is like when God rules and reigns over his kingdom. Creation is being restored. Physical decay and corruption is being overcome. Bodies are being healed. Life is being made new. This is what it's like to live under the rule and reign of King Jesus. And the miracles of the Lord Jesus are just a taste, we could say a first fruits of what's to come. We, uh, we went to Costco yesterday, and as we were going through Costco, you know, there's samples. There were samples out everywhere. They have the sample tables, you know. There are so many people. People love the samples, right, at Costco. And there are so many people who wanted the samples. There were traffic jams everywhere because you couldn't get your cart through the aisle. And so there was one where uh, they had hot dogs as samples, and basically what they do is they take a hot dog, regular hot dog, and they chop it up into like eight different pieces, I guess. So you get like a little like one inch hot dog, like that, you know. And, uh, and so people will come by and they get the hot dog and stuff. And then you know Sam sells everything in mass. So you eat your like one inch little hot dog and then you turn to the freezer and you look and there's like the jumbo pack of 50 hot dogs that you can buy, right. I don't know if it's 50 hot dogs, but it's a lot of hot dogs. Well, on a much more serious note, and on a grander scale, the miracles of Jesus and the gift of the Holy Spirit are just a taster, just an appetizer of God's full redemption and salvation. And what Paul is saying here is having tasted the first fruits of the Spirit, the first fruits of God's salvation, We long and wait for the full harvest, which is the redemption of all creation and the redemption of our bodies. The Apostle Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 4 through 5. For while we are still in this tent, he's referring to our body. He refers to our body as a tent. For while we are still in this tent, we groan. That sounds like Romans 8, doesn't it? While we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, that is, not that we would lose this broken, corrupt body, but that we would be further clothed, that is, we'd be given a new body, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee, or as he says in Romans 8, as the first fruits. So, The who of the hope of the children of God is those who have received the first fruits of the Spirit. The what of the hope of the children of God is we long for the fullness of our adoption and the redemption of our bodies. Third, third point, the nature of the hope of the children of God. The nature of the hope of the children of God. Look there in verse 24 and 25. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. There's a number of things we see in these verses about the nature of the hope of the children of God. We see 
that the hope of the children of God is a certain hope. Paul says there in the text, for in this hope you were saved. Now, just backing up, kind of taking a bigger picture of the use of this word in the Bible, we have to understand that in modern English, we often use the word hope much like we use the word wish. I wish something were true. You know, we might say, I hope that it's a a sunny afternoon. But oftentimes, that is more of a wish than it is a certain hope, right? We don't really know if it's going to be sunny or not. I'm just saying, I wish. But we use the word hope. Or, my father went to Georgia Tech, and so I'm a Georgia Tech fan. And the, uh, (laughs) hey, no uprisings here. The last several years, you might have heard me say during football season, I hope Tech wins this Saturday. But I can promise you, that was more wishful thinking, right? That was not a certain hope. We've had a rough several years. In the Bible, to hope, though, as Randy Alcorn says, means to expect a certain thing. Hope in the Bible is characterized by assurance, by confidence. And biblical hope stands on a sure foundation, on the sure foundation of the historicity of Jesus' life, death, death, and resurrection. It also stands on the sure foundation of God's certain promises. In fact, this is the way the Apostle John presents the new heavens and the new earth to us in Revelation 21. In Revelation 21, verse 1, we read, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and earth passed away, and the sea was no more. And then John records in verse 5, And he, that is the Lord, was seated on the throne and said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. So the Christian hope is a sure, certain hope based on the foundation of the historicity of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection and the sure and certain promises of God. We also see, though, that the hope of the children of God, not only is it certain, but it's also unseen. Look there in the text. Paul says in verse 24, Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? Now, what is it that we do not see? What is the hope that we have in this passage that we do not see? Well, we do not yet see the new heavens and the new earth. We do not yet see our resurrected bodies that are glorified and restored and perfect and complete. In our scientific age, someone might object and say, well, if you can't see it, then how can you believe it? If you can't see it, how can you be confident and assured, even certain, of its existence or its reality? You know, I think one of the greatest tragedies of the scientific age is the assumption, at least by some, that the only things in this life that can be believed and trusted are physical things that can fit in a test tube or be handled in a scientific lab. There is so much in life that we experience, so much in life that brings us joy that involves non-physical realities like love and mercy and justice and morality and God himself. Even something like gravity is something that we experience in this life but we can't see. Now, someone might object and say, yeah, you can't see it, but you can see its effects. But in many ways, the same can be said of the gospel, can it not? We can see the effects of the gospel upon the world as the lives of millions and millions of people have been changed and cultures and civilizations have been transformed. We can see the effects of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ as untold number of people can bear witness to how he has transformed their lives. In fact, Jesus made a similar argument like this in John chapter 3, verse 8, when he was speaking to Nicodemus. Jesus said, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, 
but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. In other words, you can't see the Holy Spirit, but you can see the effects of the Holy Spirit upon a person's life as they are changed and transformed by the gospel. In fact, the Bible says that in one sense, the most real and permanent and lasting things in this world are not seen but they are unseen. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, We look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And so this hope that we have is a certain hope. It's an unseen hope. But notice also here in our text we see that it's an expectant hope. Paul says in verse 25, But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. That word wait there in verse 25 is used several times in this section in Romans chapter 8. So look at verse 19. We read, for the creation waits, that's the same word, with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Or verse 23, we ourselves groan inwardly as we wait, there it is again, eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Or now in verse 25, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. That word wait there in the original is uh, apodecomai. And the word there, dekomai, that makes up part of the word, means to welcome or to greet. It's closely associated with the idea of hospitality. Our family, we rent our house out every year for masters. And it's, if you've rented your house out for masters, you know this. It's a lot of hard work. I mean, every spring, it feels like spring cleaning on steroids. And, uh, you, you know, doing all this work to get everything ready. And once you get it ready, you're ready to welcome the guest. You're eager to in one sense. There's been so much put into to getting the house ready for this moment. And so my wife, Nikki, she will put on a, uh, she puts a welcome board in our foyer and it has the name of the guest on there and welcomes them to Augusta. And we have a welcome basket on the counter in the kitchen, a special master's welcome basket. And we have our master's flag flying out in the front yard, ready to welcome our guest into the home. In part because we get some nice cash from the week, right? And so we're eager to welcome our guest into the city. And you've probably experienced something similar if you've gotten your home ready and put in the effort and the work to host your family for Thanksgiving or Christmas or July 4th this week. And my friends, as we consider the second coming of the Lord Jesus, the day of our final redemption, how much more should we be eager to have the house ready? How much more should we be eager to have the gift basket prepared, the flag waving in the front yard, the door wide open, ready to enthusiastically welcome and joyfully receive the Lord Jesus on the day of our redemption? This hope is an expectant hope. We wait eagerly for the day of redemption. And this is the tension that we live in as Christians. And this is in one way in which the Christian faith so accurately, I think, describes the human experience. You see, the Christian life is not just one big cheesy grin. As Christians, we are not ignorant or oblivious to the real suffering and disappointment and hurt of living in a fallen world. As Christians, we testify that we groan. And at the same time, the Christian life is not a morose, somber life. We've been given the Spirit. We've been given new life in Jesus. We possess the certain hope of a new heavens and a new earth and the promise of full redemption. And so this is the tension that we live in. Paul speaks of it in another place as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. It seems to me, therefore, that often the Christian will be characterized by a smile on his face 
which emerges from a deep well of joy in his heart from communing with Christ and for looking forward to the hope of the promise of redemption. And he will have a tear in his eye as he is aware of his own failings, as he bears his own cross, as he is attuned to the sufferings of this world. And oftentimes, those two things are occurring simultaneously at the same time. Because the Christian hope, as Paul describes it here, is a hope that is characterized both by groaning because of the fallenness of this world and gladness because of the great hope and life that we have in Christ. So we've considered the who of the hope of the children of God, the what of the hope of the children of God, the nature of the hope of the children of God, and then fourth and finally, the comparison of the hope of the children of God. Look there in verse 18 and we read these words. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in or revealed to us. So as we look at this section, verses 18 to 25, this in many ways is kind of the introductory or header to the whole section. It's kind of the banner that flies over it all here in verse 18. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Now, what are the sufferings of this present world that Paul is speaking of here? Well, if we just look at chapter 8... Paul describes to us what some of these sufferings are. It would include our ongoing battle with sin. Look there in chapter 8, verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. That's a real part of our suffering as Christians, the ongoing battle that we have with our flesh. Or in addition to that, these sufferings also involve the reality of living in a broken and fallen world. So in verses 20 to 21, Paul speaks of the subjection to futility that this creation experiences, or that creation is under the bondage to corruption. And so we experience that, right, in this world. Earthquakes and tornadoes and volcanoes and mudslides and physical disease. That's part of the suffering that we experience as Christians. And then if we go further down in the chapter, which we'll be considering in the weeks to come, Paul speaks of that suffering which comes into our lives as a result of being faithful to Jesus and to the gospel. So you look there in chapter 8, verse 35, Paul speaks of tribulation and distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, the sword. These are some of the sufferings that we experience in this present life. These are some of the sufferings that cause us to groan and cause us to sigh. But what is the glory that is to be revealed to us? Well, Paul has told us in verse 23, it's our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies in a new heavens and a new earth in which all things are restored and made whole. And notice that Paul indicates that these two things, sufferings and glory, are inseparable from one another. So, so look at chapter 8, verse 17. There Paul says, We are heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we also may be glorified with Him. Do you see how Paul says there that suffering and glory goes hand in hand? The cross comes before the crown. Death comes before resurrection. Suffering precedes glory. But at the same time, Paul goes on to say that they are not worth comparing. They are inseparable. They go hand in hand. But you cannot compare the two in one sense because one so far outpaces and surpasses the other that they're not even worth comparing. Kent Hughes, a Christian preacher, says it this way, quote, We can compare a thimble of water with the sea, but we cannot compare our sufferings with the coming glory. Isn't that beautiful? 
We could go on to say we could compare a grain of sand to a mountain. We could compare a popsicle stick to the giant sequoias, trees out in California. We can compare an amoeba that you have to look at under a microscope to a whale. We can compare a small flickering candle to the sun, but we cannot compare our light and momentary afflictions of today with the surpassing glory that we will experience in the world to come. After we rule and reign with the Lord Jesus for 10,000 years, with real bodies, in a real physical world, we will say with the Apostle Paul, no comparison. And listen, my friends, as one author says, that doesn't trivialize the sufferings of this world. As Christians, we recognize the sufferings of this world and we recognize the pain and the grief and the sorrow that we experience in this world is real. It does not trivialize the sufferings of this world, but it does put them in perspective. And oh, how we so desperately need that perspective. That whatever sufferings we experience in this life, in the next life, we will come to realize that in many ways, that wasn't even our real life. I mean, it was real, but it's not really what God had created us for. We were just being prepared for a greater glory, a greater life that was our real life all the time. The Apostle Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 17. So we do not lose heart. Have you lost heart? Are you weary? Are you discouraged? Are you ready to give up? Don't. So we do not lose heart. Why? Though our outer self is wasting away, this this frail, fallen body is wasting away, it's corrupting, it's decaying. Our inner self, by the Spirit, is being renewed day by day for this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all. All comparison. This is our hope. This is the hope of the children of God. Therefore, do not lose hope. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for the good news of the gospel. And Lord, we thank you that in a world that is full in many ways of groaning and is a universal experience that all know that, Lord, through the gospel of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, you have given us hope, an eternal hope, a lasting hope, a true and certain hope. And, Lord, we pray that you would encourage our hearts with this great hope this morning. We pray that our lives would be built upon this hope and that we would live in light of the hope of our redemption. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the promises of the gospel. And we pray that you would take them and apply them to our hearts now. And it's through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we ask it. Amen. Well, this time we are going to continue to worship the Lord as we take communion together. And if you are here this morning, sorry, and you are a Christian, uh, you've turned from your sins and trusted in the Lord Jesus Uh, we invite you to take the bread and the cup this morning. Uh, The way that we'll do this is uh, we will come forward to receive the bread and the cup, and we'll ask the balcony to come forward first. And then after the balcony has come forward, uh, we we will work from the back forward. There'll be ushers to let you know when your row can come. And uh, you come, receive the bread and the cup, and then as you return to your seat, uh, you can take it when you are ready. During this time, there'll be music playing in the background and encourage you to use this time as a time of reflection and prayer. And this morning, as we prepare to take communion together, uh, I want to read a passage of Scripture from uh, Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 to 28. So this is Jesus when he is instituting uh, the Lord's Supper. 
And we read there, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And you see, there is this sense, of course, in the Lord's Supper, we're looking back, right? We're remembering. But there's also a sense in the Lord's Supper, as Jesus indicates here, that we're looking forward. And there he says, as he gives them the cup, that he will not drink of the cup. He will not drink wine any longer, if you're Baptist grape juice. He will not drink it any longer, right? Until new in the kingdom, right? Until the new kingdom has come. And then that'll be the best wine he's ever drank, right? Because it's representative. It's representative not only of good wine. It's representative of the communion and fellowship that he will have with the Father and with his people forever in the new heavens and in the new earth. So as we come to take the Lord's Supper this morning, as we come to take the bread and the cup, not only look back, but also look forward. Be reminded of the great hope that Christ purchased for us in His death and in His resurrection. Those who are helping to serve, if you'll come forward at this time, and in the balcony, you can begin to make your way uh, down to the front, and uh, let's worship the Lord together as we take the Lord's Supper.
Amen, church. Let's stand and sing one last song together. Christ, our hope in life.
Church, receive this benediction from 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 through 17. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Go in peace.